Democracy Now! was covering the standoff at Standing Rock earlier this month, on Labor Day weekend. We spoke to Winona LaDuc, longtime Native American activist, executive director of the group Honor the Earth. She lives and works on the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. She spent years successfully fighting a pipeline similar to Dakota Access, the Sandpiper Pipeline. We met her right outside the Red Warrior camp, where she has set up her teepee. Red Warrior is one of the encampments where thousands of Native Americans, representing hundreds of tribes from across the U.S. and Canada, are currently res resisting the pipeline. Line's construction. Her teepee is painted with animals that are threatened by climate change. We began by asking Winona LaDuc why communities are now protesting the pipeline. It's time to end the fossil fuel infrastructure. I mean, these people on this reservation, they don't have adequate infrastructure for their houses. They don't have adequate, adequate energy infrastructure. They don't have adequate highway infrastructure. And they're looking at a $3.9 billion pipeline that will not help them. It will only help oil companies. And so that's why we're here. You know, we're here to protect this land. Explain what happened to the Sandpiper Pipeline, the one that you protested, the one that you opposed. What we opposed, yeah. So for four years, the Enbridge Company said that they absolutely needed a pipeline that would go from Clearbrook, Minnesota to Superior, Wisconsin. That was the critical and only possible route. They proposed a brand new route that would go through the heart of our best wild rice lakes and territory, skirting the reservations, but within our treaty territory. They did not consult with us, and they made some serious errors in their process. They underestimated what was going to happen. In there. And so for four years, we battled them in the Minnesota regulatory process, which is a process which is more advanced and slightly more functional than North Dakota's regulatory process, which, from what I can see, is largely non existent. And in that process, we attended every hearing, we intervened legally, we rode our horses against the current of the oil, we had ceremonies, and um, they canceled the pipeline. That's what they did after four years. Very, very ardent opposition by Minnesota cit citizens, tribal governments, tribal people you know, on that line. And um, that pipeline, you know, big problem. We still have six pipelines in northern Minnesota to go to Superior, the furthest inland port. Um, but the new proposals are not going to happen there. Enbridge has said that they still want to continue with their proposals for Line 3. The first pipeline they want, they want to abandon. The beginning of a whole new set of problems in North America, the abandoning of 50-year-old pipelines with no regulatory clarity as to who is responsible. And so we are opposing them on that, that they cannot abandon and they cannot, they still cannot get a new route. But when they announced that, you know, in my area, I could have said, hey, good luck, y'all. We beat it here. Good luck. You know, but no, we said we're going to follow them out here, too, because we believe that, you know, we could spend our lives fighting one pipeline after another after another, but someone needs to challenge the problem and say, this is not the way to go, America. This is not the way to go for any of us. So also, we came out here to support these people. So talk about everyone who's out here. There are a lot of people out here, you know. I, it's very funny because I feel like I've been like the the Standing Rock switchboard, the travel guide for the past two weeks. You know, everybody hits me up on Facebook, calls me up, hey, LaDuke, I want to bring out this. I got some winter coats. You know, what should I do? I was like, oh, my gosh, you know. So a lot of people are coming here united, you know. So what I know is out here is like, you know, I, I go walk in here and I'd seen people from the, you know, from Wounded Knee in 1973. i seen people I worked with in, in opposing uranium mining in the Black Hills in the 1970s and 80s, you know, out here. I mean, I, I've been at this a while. I, you know, it's like old home week out here. I've seen people from Oklahoma that oppose the Key, Keystone XL pipeline in Nebraska. And I've seen people from, you know, out in our territory that are opposing the pipelines here. The tribal chairman of Fond du Lac is here. And, you know, a whole host of, you know, native and non-native people. And there are a lot of people that just, you know, do not believe that this should happen anymore in this country that are very willing to put themselves on the line non-Indian people, you know, as well as tribal members, and they are, they, are, they are here, and it is a beautiful place to defend. For people who are watching in New York and Louisiana, in California and in India, China and South Africa, why does this matter to them? This matters because it's time to move on from fossil fuels. You know, this is the same battle that they have everywhere else. You know, each day or each week, there's some new leak. There's some new catastrophe in the fossil fuel industry, you know, as well as the ongoing and growing catastrophe of climate change. The fact that there is no rain in Syria has directly to do with these fossil fuel companies. You know, all, all of the catastrophes that are happening elsewhere in the world has to do with the fact that, you know, North America is retooling 
its infrastructure and going after the dirtiest oil in the world, the tar sands oil and the oil out of North Dakota, the fracked oil, rather than, you know, they, they, they were working with Venezuela. It also has to do with crushing Venezuela because Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. And rather than do business with Venezuela, they were bound and determined to take oil from places that did not want to give it up and create this filthy infrastructure. So this carbon, this, this oil is very heavy in carbon and will add hundreds of millions of tons of CO2 to the environment if these pipelines are allowed to. So that is, you know, it, it affects everybody. Now, some tribes are for the pipeline. Can you describe the division? Yeah, I don't know that I would say some tribes are for it. I would say some interests in Indian country have been for the pipeline. I mean, historically, the three affiliated tribes is an oil-producing tribe, but they came down here to support the opposition to the pipeline. They came down there, their, tribe, their whole tribal council came down here a couple of days ago. You know, but the fact is, is that, you know, some tribes have been forced into pr production of fossil fuels. 85% of the Navajo economy, for instance, is fossil fuel based. About the same percentage of the Fort Berthold economy is fossil fuel based. So, you know, just to give a little historic picture, you come out here with your smallpox and you wipe out 95% of the people, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Irikara people in the early 1800s. They live along these villages, you know, just trying to hang in there. Then you come out here and you, and you flood their land. And the agricultural crops that they produced are now owned by Monsanto and Syngenta as trademarked, you know, varieties that they created, right? And then you, you, you're out here in North Dakota and everybody in the country flies over North Dakota and looks down and says, well, that's North Dakota. Nobody comes out here. And so stuff continues out here for 100 years where these people are treated like third class citizens, you know, where they have no running water in their houses and they have oil companies coming out here and you have high rates of, of abuse and violence against women and children, and it accelerates and increases in the oil fields until you have an epidemic of drugs, which now hits this community. This community doesn't get any benefit from oil, but the meth and heroin that came out of those fields is here, you know, because if those dealers came up here and then they saw these Indian people, and they said, well, we'll just go there. And so these reservations are full of it, you know. And then you say, you know, to that tribe up there, they say, you, the BIA, you know, cuts them back, backyard deals and starts oil extra extraction. And so then you... The Indian, the of Indian Affairs. Bureau of Indian Affairs, and then you end up with oil, you end up with haves and have-nots in the oil fields, and you end up with a tribe that now has oil revenues that are coming in. And they look out there, frankly, and they say, you know, things haven't been going too well for us, so we're going to sign a few more of these leases because, after all, you know, nothing has ever worked out well for us, and so we're going to get a little bit of money. And that's how you get, you know, you force people into that with a gun to their head, and then they end up destroying their land, you know, which is what is happening up there in that, on that reservation. And they, they've had huge investigations into corruption at the leadership, but, you know, you force poor people, you force people into that situation, and it's a perfect storm. You've talked and written about Native Americans having PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Yeah, we have ongoing. <laughs> I didn't finish it. I still have it. You know, you say Enbridge and I get this little, like, quirk, you know, and because the Indian Wars are far from over out here. But, you know, what you get is intergenerational trauma is what is known as historic trauma. And other people have it, but you have a genetic memory and you look out there and you see every day you wake up and you see that your land was flooded. And that big power line that runs through this land, that doesn't benefit you. You still have to, you know, that everything that is out here was done at your expense, but you still have to pay for it and every day you go out there and some you know you got a roadblock you know that the white people put up coming into your reservation and every day you go out there and you look at your at your houses and you see that you've got crumbling infrastructure and nobody cares about it and you got a meth epidemic and you got the highest suicide rates in the country but nobody pays attention you know and so you just try to survive that's what you're trying to do like 90 percent of my community generally i would say is just trying to survive you know i mean in my community we have rice we still have our wild rice, and we can go and we can harvest wild rice, and we can be Anishinaabe people. You know, we can still live off of our land. You know, these people have a much tougher time, you know, living off of their land. Their buffalo were wiped out, you know. But this here is their stand. This is their stand. They got a chance to not, not have one more bad thing happen to them. And from my perspective, my perspective is, is that $3.9 billion pipeline, these guys don't need a pipeline. What they need is solar. What they need is wind. Look at this wind. You know, what they need, they have like class seven wind out here. What they need is solar on all their houses, solar thermal. They need housing that works for people. They need energy justice. This is this chance, America, to say, look, 
this community does not need a pipeline. What this community means needs is real energy independence. They call this energy independence, you know, shoving a pipeline down people's throats so that Canadian oil companies can benefit and, you know, a bunch of people can, worse, the world can worsen. That is not energy independence. Energy independence is when you have solar. Energy independence is when you have wind. Energy independence is when you have some control over your future. That's what these people want. That was Winona LaDuke, longtime Anishinaabe activist from White Earth Reservation, northern Minnesota. That's saying